introduced in the passage that we read in the New Testament, Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, and the words that I want us to consider with God's help this morning we find in verse 8, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul writes there, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, of David as preached in my gospel, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. 306. 306. That was the number of British and Commonwealth soldiers that were executed during World War I. And the reason they were executed was for cowardice a, a, and a desertion. And it seems that between 1914 and 1918, the, the British Army identified at least 80,000 men with what would now be a, considered to be shell shock or the modern day term PTESED. It is that those who experienced this, they couldn't stand the thought of being in the front line any longer, and so it was that they deserted. That was the result of the shell shock of the PDSD. And once caught, it is that they received a court martial, and if sentenced to death, each individual was shot by a 12 man a firing squad. Now, what's interesting, I think, tellingly and sadly, when it is, if you look at the history books, is that these executions eh, were primarily of non-commissioned ranks. And it is that they included at least 25 Canadians, 22 Irishmen, and five New Zealanders. And such executions as eh, these for a eh, desertion and cowardice, even today, 100 years now forward since the First World War, it is that they remain a source of eh, controversy, with some believing that many, if not all, of those who were executed that it is that they were a, that themselves, they should have been pardoned, for it was the case that they were suffering from shell shock, as I said, what we know today is called PTSD. Now, one can only but imagine something of the horrors that it must have been, a, what it must have been like for those a, who were in the trenches during the First World War. I can remember speaking to my great uncle, and it is that he, at 14, he had gone to the recruiting place, and he said he was 16, and they accepted him. Very quickly, he was found in the trenches in France. And I remember him telling me that one of the ways that uh, you knew that an individual who was wounded had died was because you would see the body lice leaving the body as it cooled. And then it is that the body lice would be looking for uh, other warm bodies and they would take up residence there. And I came across a part of a letter by a chap called Victor Sylvester who had been uh, in the trenches. And this is what he writes. He says, we are up into the front line near Arras through sodden and devastated countryside. As we were moving up to our sector along the communication trenches, a shell burst ahead of me and one of my platoon dropped. He was the first man I ever saw killed. Both his legs were blown off and the whole of his body and face was peppered with shrapnel. The sight turned my stomach. I was sick and terrified, but listen to this, but even more frightened of showing it. He was more frightened of showing that at that point he was fearful. But in some ways, for those who had ended up in the front lines, this wasn't how it was meant to be. The war itself began on June the 28th, 1914, and the general consensus of many was that it would certainly be over by Christmas. But by November, by, by November the 11th, 1918, 38 million had died. And the optimism that characterized the second half of 1914 had been replaced by pessimism and horror indeed hardly concerning the hard reality of war. Now the reason that I begin like this is because I wonder if it is that for the early Christians, and especially those who were found in the city of Rome, that that was something of their own experience, that they began with a great sense of optimism, what it was that God had been doing in them, and indeed in the church at Rome, and yet as the decades went by, that optimism had been replaced by a sense of fear and the hard reality of persecution. You remember that the first century Rome it had been a rather welcoming place for the new Christian religion, as, as they called it. And Rome had protected a religious practices, and Paul's religious practice, until AD 64, a, when it was that a scapegoat was needed a, for Nero's urban renewal project, a, and it was sparked by a fire that, as we know, burned for a, six to seven days. And it was thereafter that the Christians in Rome and in the vicinity of Rome that they became enemies of the state, and it was that they became enemy number one. 
But that hadn't been the case for Timothy, even as Paul writes to him here, and in the previous decades up until this point. The, the city that Timothy lived in was the city of Ephesus, and it was a city that was a long way from Rome and the persecution that was taking place in, in Rome. Paul doesn't hint that Timothy will soon be in prison, although we know it did happen at another time. If you go to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 23, the implication is that Timothy is being released from prison at that point. But one of the things that Paul indicates to Timothy, and indeed for all who would read this letter, is that he's presently under persecution, and he's under persecution for his hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is that I think that Timothy, along with many of his day, and indeed with those down through the centuries, even up until today, who are followers of Jesus Christ, that in the midst of the battle, in the midst of the enemy and his onslaughts, in the midst even of our own failings and weaknesses and hypocrisies and so on, that it is that we, along with Timothy, are in danger of deserving. That it is that there's a sort of spiritual shell shock, or in modern day terms, a sort of spiritual PTSD that can get a grip of us, and it almost roots us to the spot, and it takes any vitality, any hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, and it seeks to bury it, even along with ourselves, even spiritually and, and physically. And that's why it is that I think that Paul says to Timothy in this letter that he's not to be ashamed of the fact that Paul is a prisoner. He's not to be ashamed of this, and it is that he's to join in suffering for the gospel, if it is that you go to chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul says, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Everything seemed good, Timothy. Everything, you were full of optimism, but now it is that things have changed. And you yourself are experiencing things that you thought you would never have to deal with. Think of how it is that in chapter 2, verse 3, Paul he encourages Timothy to join him in hardship and suffering as a good soldier of Christ. Then it is, if you go into chapter 3, and verse 12, he tells us that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And it is that Timothy faced hardship. So Paul writes in chapter 4 and verse 5 that he is someone who is to endure hardship. Now the hardship in Timothy's day may have come across and, and manifest itself in a thousand different ways for Timothy than it does for us here 2,000 years later. But the point that Paul is making at this point is that the same truth that enabled Paul to undergo a persecutions to be found in prison, and yet still to have his hope and faith in Christ that enabled him to endure prison is the same truth that will buy a Timothy's a endurance and also our endurance, no matter whatever the circumstances or the unfolding of God's providence in our own life. You see, the application is, is I think, very simply, that even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of the spiritual warfare that all of God's people are called to, it is that we are called to a consistently robust faith and a faith that's to be lived out in every circumstance of life. And the question is, does that seem possible? Are some of you sitting here today and you're saying, very good, Alan. It's good from the pulpit to be able to say that. But what about in the situation that I'm finding myself in? See, how about when a Christian suffers with an unbelieving spouse or unbelieving parents. How do I cope with that? How about when it is that colleagues at work shun me or attempt to make the workplace miserable for me because it is that I profess faith in Christ? How about any of the students here amongst us today that it is that you're mocked and ridiculed because of your faith in Christ? How about when the demands of, of life, of everyday life, begin to squeeze a Christian, and it makes you feel that God has abandoned you. If you're like that here today, that God's providence has worked out for you, you feel that he's abandoned you. How about when your health fails, jobs tumble, and every plan for the future turns out the opposite from the way that you would have hoped it would be? And I'm saying to you, is the gospel still just as powerful? Is the gospel able to sustain and uphold you and fill you with joy even in the midst of sadness. Can you endure with a robust faith in Jesus Christ? Well, that's what Paul, I think, one of the things that we can take from the text here this morning. 
that in the midst, and especially what he's written in the first seven verses, Paul then says to Timothy, Timothy, you've got to do something. And the thing that you've got to do, Timothy, is to use your memory. And the way it is that I want you to use your memory, Timothy, is that you would remember Jesus Christ. You would remember him in his humanity. You would remember him in his divinity. You would remember him in his resurrection. And you would remember the power that he has promised by his spirit to give to all who profess faith in his name. And you see, Paul is saying to us that we are called to remember Jesus. And it's especially important for us, I think, in understanding what it is that Paul has been doing in this chapter. In verses 1 to 7, the focus is on how the Christian can be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, no matter how difficult life may seem. And it is that Paul sets forth the need for grace in the light of the possibility and the probability of, of suffering for and standing for the gospel of Christ in a community that gloried in their paganism. But the irony is that some of the a strongest forces that opposed Timothy actually came from within the church. Among those who should have been rallying with Timothy and proclaiming these truths along with them, what does Timothy find? False teaching, disunity, immoral behavior, rebellion against authority, and itching ears that had turned from the truth. So how could Timothy continue living among such people and ministering to them? He would need grace to endure, just as we do. How would he find that grace? He would find it in the process, Paul says in verses 1 to 7, single-mindedness, like a soldier, discipline like an athlete, and diligence like a farmer. So how is he able to do this? Paul comes in with verse 8. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. What is he wanting us to do? Well, I think he's directing us that we have a continuous action in our lives. It is that he focuses, Timothy, and as we should focus, on the person of Jesus Christ. The command is very simple. Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. Now, grammatically, it's the present tense that he uses. And whenever that's used in a New Testament Greek, it calls for a regular, ongoing practice of remembrance. It literally could be translated, keep on remembering Jesus Christ. Keep on remembering Jesus Christ. Now it is that I think Paul follows his Old Testament counterparts with this a, a, a idea of remembrance. I think in the Old Testament, the Passover meal, it was a vivid, very vivid meal of remembrance of God's mercy in delivering Israel from Egypt. It is that there were these little boxes, the phylacteries, with scripture in them, and they were worn on the arms and the heads, and little tassels on the ends of either robes as reminders of God's law. What about when it is that the ancient people entered into the Promised Land? There were twelve stones arranged by the side of the Jordan. Why? That they would be stones of remembrance. That it would be the case that from then onwards, that the people would never forget. What about the many festivals in Israel? They reminded the people of the particular acts of God on behalf of the nation Israel. And what about us, even last Lord's Day evening, as we sat at the Lord's table, we remembered the death of Jesus until he comes. It's something that we're called upon to participate in, to do continually, and it is therefore have, remember, have these great truths brought to mind. And the reason that we need these things is because at times we forget. We don't even do it maliciously or intentionally, but we become so preoccupied with so many other things, and our minds are, are, are so full of so many things, that it is that sometimes we quite naturally forget. It's understandable in the busy routine of life that simple things, like remember Jesus, that these would be squeezed out. I think about the husband and his wife, he calls them in his work. And she says, dear, on the way home, can you stop in at the grocery store and buy some a milk and bread? And it is as soon as he walks through the door, when he gets home, his wife's standing there and she sees him and she says, you forgot the milk and the bread. And it is that he's standing there and his face goes red because how on earth did I forget that? But when it is that you begin to analyse why he forgets, maybe he's dealing with major issues at work. 
Maybe he's been troubled about <coughs> the recent news of a close friend's terminal illness. Maybe he's even thinking, how am I going to pay the bills this month? Far less put bread and milk on the table. How is it that I'm going to keep my home and so on? And when he hears these words, he forgot the milk. It's not a major crisis, but it's speaking of the fact that at times, things press in and crowd out the things that we are called to remember. Paul says, remember Jesus. Not your religion, not your philosophy of life, not even your need to keep the golden rule, but remember Jesus. What's involved? He's saying, think about him. Think about the incarnation. Think about the fact that he became flesh. And if it is that we do that, it involves certain things. It tells us, when we remember Jesus, that he took a human body. Now what's remarkable is that one of the earliest heresies that faced the church with regard to the person of Christ, it wasn't a denial of his divinity, but it was a, a denial of his humanity. And a heresy known as Docetism it was a heresy that plagued the early church. You go to John's first letters, and that's what John is talking about and combating when it is that he speaks about those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh, and he says they are antichrist. And the peculiar philosophical position of the Docetus was that matter was evil, and therefore it was abhorrent that God should become incarnate in the sense of being in flesh, the enfleshment of God, as we call it. And according to their view, the very physicalness of the body of Christ was only a seeming. Therefore, the term docetism, and that comes from the Greek word dokeo, that means I seem. In other words, it was only an appearance, a phantasm, that when Christ was in their midst, it was not a real three-dimensional, historical, visible, touchable, relational, windable, flesh and blood person that stood before them is that John, as I say, writes against. Think of it as John who tells us that when the Lord's side was pierced on the cross, what came out? Blood and water. Something that could never have happened if Christ was just a spirit or an apparition. John's Gospel, in many ways, one of the most earth of the <coughs> Gospels. But the great fact is that because of the enfleshment of Christ, Jesus Christ, God's Son, your Saviour and my Saviour, he took a human body which is the same, exactly the same, biochemical composition as our own, the same anatomy, the same physiology, the same central nervous system, the same sensitivity to pain. That's the three-dimensional enfleshment of God that Paul exhorts us to remember. He's saying remember that this was a human body, with a genetic composition that was similar to your own, although it was the case that he had a specific code that was peculiar to him as the individual that he was. He's saying, remember, that to this genetic composition, his mother made the same contribution as any other mother makes to the genetic makeup of her child. One half of the chromosomes of Jesus Christ came from his mother Mary, and the rest were imparted miraculously in the creative act of the virgin birth. And through his mother too, the Lord's humanness, his enfleshment, is given specificity and particularity. He was not humanity, per se. He was not, as it were, that in, in, in one sense, just standing there as humanity. But it is that particularly and specifically, Jesus Christ was a first century Jew rooted in the culture of the people of his day. But it's equally true that through his mother, through the umbilical cord, that this Jesus was keyed into the life stream of the human race and to the whole created order. And therefore in the incarnation of the Son, the redemptive process has entered not merely the world of the spirit, but into the world of matter. And it's the case that matter as well as spirit is redeemed through this person, Jesus. And the glorious and astounding thing is this, that this link with matter never has been and never will be severed. It is the God-man Christ who is at the right hand of God today. It is that one who is found in a glorified and yet human body. 
and the resurrection body of the Lord in many ways is the omega point of the material creation. That it's that which stands above all else. The point at which the skill, the wisdom, the power, the artistry of God find their extreme a, 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 and their supreme expression. On the other side, wonderful is what I'm saying is this. In and through this body that he took unto himself, the Lord became vulnerable. Vulnerable to physical privation. Wonderful, vulnerable to pain. And vulnerable at last to physical death. That's why we need to stress unreservedly and emphatically that the Lord took a human body. Why? Because it's saying to us that the gospel is not only interested in ideas. That the gospel primarily is not interested in that which is abstract. Sometimes I think we forget that. And we end up theologically going down so many highways of abstraction. But the gospel is concerned with facts as much as it is concerned with matter. In other words, the gospel, and the gospel as enfleshed in the person of Jesus, exists in the world of physics and biology. In other words, your world, my world, the world with all its difficulties, all its dangers, the world when at times we're moved to say, God, have you forsaken me? Have you turned your back on me? Why are you allowing this to happen in my life, Lord? That's what Paul says, remember Jesus. Remember him, Timothy, when you're frightened. Remember him when you're downcast, Timothy. Remember him when things go the exact opposite way than you expected them to go. Remember Jesus, Timothy. And if it is that, that Jesus took a body and that's the case, Jesus also took therefore a human psychology. And that's why Paul is saying, remember Jesus. Remember the answer eh, in the short catechism, eh, number 22, answer 22. You read that Jesus became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. Now this too was denied by an early heresy called Apollinarianism. And Apollinarianism was the product of oversensitiveness regarding the deity of Christ. Apollinarius was concerned to safeguard the fact that Christ was, was God and in so doing he minimized his humanness. But in some ways that's the tendency I think of the church even down the past 2,000 years. His position was, Apollinarius' position was that when God became incarnate, he did take a human body, but in place of a human soul, what we found was simply God, the Logos, the eternal word. Apollinarius said there was a union between a divine nature and a human body, with that we can agree with, but then he says there was no human psychology. Now what's interesting is that the church in the 4th and 5th century AD grappled with this question and they discussed the, the issue thoroughly and they repudiated this construction that Apollinarius had come up with and they insisted that Jesus, that just as in Christ there was complete and perfect Godhead, so also in Jesus Christ there was complete and perfect manhood. Nothing that was necessary to the humanness of Jesus was lacking. Just as there was a complete human physicalness, therefore there was a complete human a psychology. Now what does that mean? Well, doesn't it, one thing it says to us is that there's a human mind when it is that we think of Christ. That our Lord had a human mind and that that human mind was limited and finite. It is that mind had to reason in a human way from premises to conclusions. It had to gather it, to store it, to organize information. Its knowledge was not as God's was intuitive. But his knowledge in terms of his human mind was inductive and deductive. Secondly, in that case, his knowledge was not absolute or infinite. 
Jesus at the human level, and sometimes we tend to forget this, he was not omniscient. And there's nothing at all novel or heretical in what I'm saying. Think of it when the Lord announces his ignorance and he confesses his ignorance at the time of the second coming. Listen to Mark 13, 32. But of that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The fellows in recent years who have predicted the second coming, you say to yourself, is it Mark 13? Do they really understand it? Is it something that they ignore? And Calvin, in his Harmony of the Evangelist, in volume 3, this is what Calvin writes, and I quote, There would be no impropriety in saying that Christ, who knew all things, was ignorant of something in respect of his perception as a man. And Calvin goes on to point out that if we refuse to accept that Christ was not omniscient, then we've got big difficulties when it is that we come to Christ's mortality. If it is that we're offended by limited knowledge, how then are you going to cope with the reality of the fact of the death of the Son of God? But Christ became wiser. Christ became better informed. Jesus accumulated an increasing fund of prudence and common sense. It was dependent on the ministry of the Spirit, and the Spirit revealed more and more to him, but it's clear that his human mind was finite and his human perception limited. He underwent normal intellectual development and so on. So that's one thing in terms of the psychology. Next thing, human emotions. That's why Paul says, remember Jesus, Timothy. Human emotions. Remember Jesus. Jesus knew, I believe, joy and contentment. We're never told that Jesus laughed, but I think it's quite wrong, unbiblical, to regard Jesus as living a life of gloom and despondency, but so often we as the church seem to live. See, Psalm 40, verse 8, what was his delight? His delight was to do the will of God. It was something that brought joy to him. What about Galatians 5 and 22? If there was anyone who was filled to the brim and over with the Spirit, it was Jesus. And what do we read in Galatians 5? What's the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Then Philippians 4, 6. Contentment is commanded by God. If there was anybody who was content, it was Jesus Christ. And so I've got no a, a, a concern in saying to you that we have every reason to believe that Jesus was at peace with himself, with his environment, and with God. Can you say that about yourself today? That you're at peace with yourself. So as I've said before, we're all very good at putting on veneers when we come to church on a Sunday. And people will say this, how are you today? Oh yes, everything's great, everything's good. It's been a great week, and the Lord's been good to me, and so on. But if you were just to scratch the veneer a little, how many of us here today have perhaps nodded inside because of fears that we have, concerns that we have? That's why Paul says, remember Jesus. He was at peace with himself. He was at peace with God. But that's not to say that Jesus Christ was a stranger to the darker side of human emotions. Jesus felt the sorrow of bereavement. There's absolutely no two ways about it. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Jesus is there at the graveside of his friend Lazarus. And as he sees what it is that sin has done, not only to humanity, but to this particular individual, what does Jesus do? He weeps. The words that are used there speak about the snorting of a horse in anger. That Jesus was angry with what he saw that death he was doing to men and women, those created in God's image. And not only that, do you not think that Jesus wept when it was that his earthly father, Joseph, died? I mean, from everything that we read about Joseph, little as it is, I get the impression that Joseph was a lovely man, that he would have been a lovely father. 
and no doubt delighted in the son that God had given to him through his wife Mary. And you're telling me that when Joseph died, that Jesus didn't weep and weep along with his mother and comfort her and strengthen her? No. What about Gethsemane? He was sore amazed. He was afraid. He didn't simply peripherally experience emotion, but he experienced fear in the horrendous depths. He's heavy, he's even sorrowful unto death. And he's so terrified of the imminent encounter between himself as a sin bearer and God in his holiness, that he shrinks from the cup and he says, if it's possible, take this cup from me. What it's saying to us today is this, that emotionally, Jesus went to the outer limits of human endurance and so close to the absolute limit that he was almost overwhelmed. And it's saying to us that Jesus was no stoic, Jesus was no robot. And the lesson for ourselves here today is absolutely priceless. In other words, we're not called upon to be ashamed of emotion. We're not called upon to be ashamed of tears. We're not called upon to be ashamed of expressing tears. Why? Because the very Son of God himself, Jesus, understands and he legitimizes emotional pain and heartache. That's why Paul is saying to Timothy, remember Jesus. That's why I'm saying to you here today, and I know some of you are going through difficult times, that God would say to you in his word, remember Jesus in the midst of your tears. In the midst of your upset, in the midst of your loss, because Jesus had a human psychology, and Jesus needed others. We see that he took three to be with him in the garden. Come with me. Let me ask you: You ever ashamed of needing others? Sadly, what nearly thirty years in the ministry. I've come across many Christians like that. I don't know why they're like that, but they declare either verbally or in other ways, I don't need others, and indeed, I'd be ashamed of needing others. What is happening to ourselves and our Christianity and our civilization when it is that we're ashamed of the need for relationships? Do you think that you can avoid fulfillment by avoiding relationships? No, absolutely not. The archetypal man, the last Adam, he needed people with him. And we see Jesus with friends, both male and female. We see how Jesus loved children. We see how Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And we see a spontaneous a, a, a affection for the rich young ruler. In other words, there's no tolerance and should be no tolerance in the life of the Christian for a detached, non-relational Christianity with its fear of getting too close and its dread of becoming too deeply involved because it is that we fear that we'll then be invulnerable. There was nobody more vulnerable than Jesus Christ. There really wasn't. You see, you can avoid all the pain in life that you want, but in order to do that, you have to avoid love. You have to avoid, as it were, putting yourself out there. You have to avoid taking down the barriers sometimes and letting people know you for who you really are and what you're really like. And the Lord was prepared to be so vulnerable, so out there, as it were. He was hurt at last, and how cruelly he was hurt. One of the twelve betrays him. The three that he took to the garden, they forsook him and they fled. And even in the cross, there's no one there to offer him encouragement and understanding. And on the cross, he knows the full horror and treachery of human infidelity. So in Jesus, there's a full human psychology. Intellectual, emotional, even volitional. And it is that we're told this Jesus dwelt among us. Let me come to, to a close with this. Not only did Jesus take our nature, but Jesus came into our environment. 
came alongside us. He became one of us. And it is that he shared our environment and therefore our problems. And that's saying to me this morning that Jesus shared our experience of pain, bereavement, of sorrow, of difficulty, temptation. That there was none who was ever so tempted as the Son of God, and yet it is. He himself experienced the pain, and yet was without sin. He tasted it in the heightened bitter taste of the cross. His every nerve heightened by his perfection. His every pain exacerbated by the glory of his uncontaminated cerebralism. His brain. And responding in a way that we could never understand. Because here was mind, here was intellect, here was brain. Such as the world had never seen. All of them now accessions to his glory. But all of them now accentuations of his pain. So what I'm saying is let's never then understand that God doesn't understand. God's Son took our nature. He entered into our experience. He knows what physical pain is. He knows what emotional and spiritual pain is. He knows what the loss of God is. He stood in outer darkness in the place where there was no comfort, in the place of the absolute why. He bore a burden such as you and I will never ever bear. He was left comfortless. We will never go beyond the pain that Christ went through. And our darkness is never, never more intense than the darkness that he experienced. And our whys are never, never more bewildered than the whine that Jesus uttered from the cross. Sometimes when it is that you have to ask, why me? Part of the answer of Jesus Christ to you is, me too. Me too. What a great lesson then in Hebrews. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but it was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. My friends, he remembers that we are dust, and he our frame well knows. He knows our nature from the inside. He's been where you and I are. He's walked through the valley of the shadow of death. He's fought with the devil. He's been in the darkness where there's no light. He can look down on us in all our struggles and turn to his father today and say, Father, I know exactly how that woman feels. Father, I know exactly what that child of mine is going through. Father, I ask that you would enrich them. Enrich them by your spirit. Enrich them with the comfort and the care of the brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, Father, I know how they're feeling and what it was like. No wonder Paul says here, even as he draws near the end of his ministry and his life, remember Jesus. I hope that for all of us today, that in the midst of God's providence, whether it be good, bad, or however we would understand it, that we would never forget Jesus that we would always remember Jesus. Amen.